Can you hear me now? Yeah. Last year we spoke about uh, reimbursement models in telehealth. Today the focus is more on population health and how to drive adoption. Um, however, I'll be happy to entertain questions on reimbursement for uh, genomics because that's a very uh, big topic as well. So. For those of you who might not know Mednax, we're a healthcare solutions partner, and although we cover several service lines such as anesthesiology and radiology, by far our largest uh, core business is women's and children's services, so therefore you'll see me focusing heavily on perinatal genomics. However, I think most of you, once we get through some of the insights I want to share with you, will realize that the same concepts can be extrapolated to the larger population. So don't think that it's valid only for the perinatal subset. And then um, before we jump into the scientific and more uh, pragmatic implementation details, I just want to share uh, the story of many, many parents across uh, not only the United States but the globe that have their children in a neonatal ICU or a pediatric ICU and want to bring this down to reality. Although we're talking about population health, there are always um, humans somewhere in the world who are desperately waiting for someone to tell them what's wrong with their child and how that child can maybe be helped or treated or at least pain can be alleviated. So. You'll see me focusing heavily on how we can scale this, but let's not forget that there are many, many, many parents every day now as we speak who are hoping for the next development in genomics and that, that hopefully can help not only treat their child but future generations to come. So we always want to keep it real. So well, how does the genomics market look like? What are we dealing with and why do we think there is an opportunity here? When you look at the United States and globally, of course, massive amounts of dollars are being thrown in this space. It's heavy technology-based so far, so when you look at how these dollars are being allocated, about 90% goes in the technological advances, and that's good too. However, I think what we're trying to show today is that that's not enough, and that certainly there are opportunities uh, how we can leverage all the major technological advances and then hopefully telehealth, I'm hoping to convince you that it can be the facilitator and the catalyst how to scale genomics and how to bring it to the next level so that it can impact population health for future generations to come. Also, some of you might be aware, I just put the kit there because most of you are familiar with, but there are many uh, sequencing companies and it has emerged currently as a direct-to-consumer opportunity, not just clinical genomics like we were accustomed to for many years. And it clearly moved away from the scientific labs like when I trained many years ago. Then on the other side, I wanted to point out that whole genome sequencing, for those of you that might not be familiar, whole genome sequencing looks at the whole human genome. For those of you who are physicians, you understand the value of that. <clears throat> it used to be that that was only very rarely possible and only in the scientific research institutes. Then it moved slowly, slowly into the rare opportunity for academic centers to order it for um, children or adults with undiagnosable uh, diseases. But now it has become, like I'll show you, something that all of us can have with very little dollars, but it has caused some other uh, issues that we have to deal with, such as ethics, reimbursement, counseling. If you get a report that tells you basically what's going to happen to you 30 years from now, how are you going to deal with it? So although today I'm not addressing ethics in genomics, it's a very big issue and um, I, I'm always very acutely aware of it. That's one of the major barriers for implementation. And then the other uh, lower end shows you why I think telehealth can be the solution. So I'm pointing out that we have massive amounts of data being generated in via genome sequencing, but we have very few experts, even on paper, that know what to do with that data and that are equipped and skilled and willing to counsel patients and physicians on how to use that data appropriately so that it's clinically actionable. Now, these are only the ones that are certified and that we know of. However, when you talk to many of them, they will admit to you certified genetic counselors sometimes and, and physicians that the field has evolved so much that they don't feel comfortable looking at a raw report for, of a whole genome or a whole exome sequencing set. So I think there's huge opportunity not only for our patients to have access to the most qualified uh, experts, 
but also to provide training programs via telehealth for all those that wish to be trained. Because I can tell you we, we speak with 6,000 clinicians on a regular basis that are in our network, and most of them say, I could not even tell you two coherent sentences about whole genome sequencing at this point. And even some that are very recently, um, have graduated very recently, and had exposure to genomics, and know what an Illumina sequencer is, they still feel that they could not interpret a report and certainly wouldn't be comfortable advising a family or a pregnant mom or in the neonatal ICU making decisions what out of that report is actionable and treatable now. And then there's that other lack of comfort. Many physicians will say, you know, I don't know how to have that conversation even if scientifically I know what it means because I'm uncomfortable. I wasn't trained. I don't know how the, the family will react to that. So this is where I believe that the genetic counselors can bring a huge, huge, huge help not only to our patients but also to our uh, physicians. And telehealth is the solution to, to link all these elements together because we do not have enough skilled uh, experts and the families and physicians are in dire need. So. Pretty much I could stop here because that's the essence, but I have a few more slides. So why genomics? Just to give you a flavor of the magnitude of the problem. This is only what we know of with a single gene testing that's being done currently. Imagine multiply this thousand fold with whole genome sequencing what's going to be necessary, how many people need counseling and testing and how many physicians will be faced with this reality. The other part that drove this exponential um, data generation is that the cost for the whole genome sequencing has gone down tremendously. So something that was unattainable several years ago, you can get it now for $550, which is unheard of. When you ask someone two years ago, they would have still told you it was in the 10K range. So we can now actually start having revenue models to show hospitals and other partners that I'll highlight that it is actually something that can be done at larger scale and you can break even and of course you can impact population health. Just real quick to summarize the benefits I already uh, emphasized. Not only can we diagnose new disease that we don't even have a name yet, but we can find variants of disease and that's very important as well because then you can help the, the patient that's currently under your care. And of course long term we want to improve population health. And what's the sweet spot between all this, right? So we feel that the telehealth opportunity is there because you link experts with the patients and the physicians, but you have to be careful how you integrate all these three elements, right? So I'll show you over the next few minutes how we think that telehealth can be the major uh, facilitator to, to impact genomics in a way that can make it standard of care for pediatrics and for maternal health. Who are the consumers? We already emphasized a few, but I want to kind of mention that health plans, we heard a little bit today from some <laughs> health plans and we might hear more, I think can be a, a huge partner in this. Having population health models where you offer it to all the beneficiaries can really help us drive the right type of population health. If you think about it, a lot of the data being generated now from adults is possibly from a population health perspective a little bit too late. If you can do the fetal testing and antenatal testing, you have even probably higher chances of, of, detect, uh, of detecting illness early and having broader impact on the population health of that specific family and region. And then of course, direct to consumers, so healthcare retailers such as CVS, Walgreens, we already know they offer the 23andMe kit, but extrapolate that to even more advanced uh, opportunities if we have a telehealth genetic counselor available in every one of these uh, then you can have a kit that you do it right there in in the store and the counseling in the store that would bring it obviously to the next level and then of course um, we we also believe that uh, genome sequencing centers and our physician networks of course have huge uh, opportunities to share their data with us and to educate uh, families and, and patients how this can contribute to their health. We believe that these three domains are the major driver and can give the highest genomics diagnostic yield, the way we call it, because the genomic material that you can collect from these three domains 
is not only highly valuable uh, for any type of topic, um, but we also believe that it, it allows early intervention, which is crucial, obviously. So what are some of the telegenetics applications to be very specific? So you want to definitely, via telehealth, provide the appropriate informed consent to the families because most physicians say, how can I give informed consent to someone if I don't even understand what whole genome sequencing is and how the report is going to come back? So most physicians in a one-to-one -one conversation would say, I really don't feel comfortable. I would lie if I say I do. So even offering that pre-testing counseling is really important. And actually, when you look at a lot of NIH studies, they had a hard time recruiting patients. Imagine you are a parent of a baby, and I ask you, hey, would you like to enroll your baby in a study? And by the way, I can't explain really what they're going to do with this whole genome sequencing, but do you want to be in the study for your baby? So who's going to say yes to that kind of approach? Not many, right? So having the appropriate informed consent and the appropriate ability to alleviate parents' concerns about what happens when that report comes back and what is the expectation for them to do with it is crucial. Otherwise, most parents will say no or will refuse to even hear about the report when it comes back, which happens many times. So there are parents who say yes, but then when they're being told, you know, we're going to show you now, we, get, we got a lot of hits on your report. So imagine if you're being told like this, that you got a lot of hits on your baby's report, that's not going to turn out well for the family, we know already, right? And then. Of course, the consultation for the treating physicians, like we just said, when you show, have, how many of you have seen a raw report of whole genome sequencing? It looks like a developer code, right? Like a mass, like 87 pages of, of a lot of things there, and you don't know which one should I act on, which one is meaningful, which one kills me now, which one kills me in 30 years, which one doesn't have any impact on me, right? So that's really important, and we, the way we are going to launch our genomic suite effective um, beginning of the year, we're going to offer that, so consultation not only for the family but also for the physicians. And then, of course, post-testing. Although many parents sometimes, if you tell them, okay, we found something, we're going to treat the child now, they're happy. But I can tell you out of my not-for-profit work, when you talk to parents years after their baby survived the NICU or the PICU, some of them say, Ingrid, I wish I would have known what this meant for our life after. Because at the beginning you're happy you have an answer. But no one counsels you appropriately how to deal with the years that are coming. And what it means to have occupational therapy and speech therapy and language therapy and hearing therapy and 17 surgeries. And parents are desperate and sometimes physicians feel ambivalent about it as well. So that post-testing should not be underestimated because it's important too. And then the other part, like we said, also for the treating physicians, because they also are faced in the ambulatory setting then as pediatricians, they go, well, so they discharge this baby, the parents come to me frantically, right, because you get discharged from the NICU or the PQ, and then you go to the pediatrician's office who faces the same challenges. They're sometimes even less exposed to those kind of uh, rare diseases or whole genome sequencing uh, that's being done in a, in a fancy NICU that might be in an academic setting or any other children's hospital. So overall, my, my main message is telehealth is crucial because it can provide access to specialty care, access to the counselors that can provide appropriate um, expertise to physicians, patients, before, during, and after testing. That's my message to you, and we hope that with the help of VC, we're going to launch it at the beginning of the year. So thank you so much. We have some time for some questions for oh, if there are questions. Yes. Oh, yeah. So my sister was born in nineteen forty two and my mother had rubella. Oh. And this was before they knew what it meant. What it meant. So she was born, she had a cataract on one eye. They didn't operate for three years, so she lost sight in that eye. They didn't know till she was 23 that she had profound deafness in one ear. And now she's 77 and she has chronic systemic issues that I think come from that. Her whole system was compromised. So someone goes through this 
and they find out pre-testing and post-testing, what, I mean, we know that when somebody tests for Tay-Sachs disease, mm -hmm. the idea is that they'll abort the baby because the baby's gonna die this terrible death. What are you saying about infants who are tested well, so you're addressing the ethics piece that I mentioned at the beginning. So thank you for sharing, first of all. I know that that's uh, very special for your family, but definitely we believe that you have the right to be offered care. And you, you, we believe that you have the right to be offered the answer if you want to hear it. And we believe that offering the appropriate counseling so that someone can have these conversations in the most expert way is the way to go. Because otherwise what's going to happen is if we don't do it the right way, Technology has advanced so much and it's happening every day that it's gonna happen every day the wrong way. So to answer your question, I think that the key point is to have the genetic counselors that know how to have these conversations and to guide the family appropriately. And like we heard today, engage appropriate mental health counselors as well where it's necessary or all other specialists. But it has to be done in a thoughtful, meaningful way. And this is the reason why I focused on the genetics counseling so much because I think that's the key and it's almost you could, you have opinions where just doing sequencing without appropriate counseling would be considered unethical. So I think if we avoid it, it's not gonna be good. We should strive together to, to do it the right way, right? Like we heard this morning, the great speaker also emphasized, if you just do genomics from a scientific point of view without understanding the complexities, the 360 aspects that, that derive out of that kind of testing, it's not gonna end up good. We're gonna just have massive data that everybody's flooded with but to your point, yes, there are important implications. And we believe that it's everybody's right to have the offering of the test, have the access to experts that can talk about this, and then to offer the appropriate care if necessary. So in another conversation, we can talk about how to make it uh, from a revenue perspective. That's the art. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, how do you bring this mainstream with the payers and and make sure it falls under the population health yeah. management. So we, we have developed several alternative payment models that would include genomics as part of a population health uh, approach for the payers. Uh, that doesn't mean everybody's jumping up and down to accept it, but we have found a way to show that the diagnostic yield on these few children that have congenital disorders, like you heard uh, a great example now, the lifetime impact for a beneficiary, when you can address an illness early on, the, the unnecessary care you can save, the unnecessary labs that you can save, the unnecessary length of stay in the hospital that you can save, the unnecessary ancillary other tests that will never give you the result, with one whole genome sequencing you can solve it. So it takes some art to make that revenue model work, but in general it's a population health approach that's like a per member per month or a cost savings approach. That's the only way. But it's not gonna be a fee for service. That's 100%. How, how did the payers react to that when you say Some that? are interested, but you have to do the analytics. So it's not gonna be that you go and convince everybody right away. So you would do a retrospective analysis for two years and you show it mathematically that, look, you spent $25 million on repetitive sequential testing for every single gene and you still didn't find a solution. And then after 60 days, you finally have a whole genome sequencing that could have solved all this unnecessary care from, from the beginning. So if you have that analytic data to show that you save dollars and save unnecessary care, then it starts to make sense. But you need that data, otherwise it's impossible to show. I hope that answers your question. Very quick question. Sure. Is the result considered pre-existing condition? You could consider yes, but, but as you know, if you read the medical policy bulletins of major payers, all of them approve whole genome sequencing with the right criteria in place. So if you can show that the uh, family pedigree has um, enough data to warrant it, they do cover it. And if you show that you have enough clinical conditions now that uh, show clinical suspicion of something to be found, they do, they do cover it, and I'm not aware of any of any case where at this point, currently, the last two years, anybody had an impact on their uh, plan because it was. So remember, that was an old problem. Now, luckily, that has changed. 
So there are more and more payers covering. They're not all. But again, all of them will cover if you know what to write in the prior authorization and you follow the strict guidelines. But it's, it's, it's an effort. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Thank you. I Thank you so much. Thank you. For Thank you.